All right, so for our first artifact, I'm going to pull up is this uh, Maka Ponsgat pebble. It may be the oldest artifact in human history. That's for us to decide as we discuss. It, by looking at this pebble and by looking at this artifact, we'll be looking at this in terms of an overarching theme, and that is what makes humans human. Or in other words, how do we know what makes a human different from anything else on planet Earth? So the Makapan's got pebble can give us a window into what makes a human being a human being. This is a very ancient object. Um, it, go, it dates back um, you know, to a very earliest times in human history. However, it's not a very significant object. It's very small, it's handheld. Um, it's not made of a really uh, solid material. It's made of this jasperite, which is kind of a softer rock. Um, but what is significant about it is that People who have looked at this, historians, artists, art historians, humanities professors, when they have seen this, they have looked at it and said, it looks like a face, right? So we can clearly see um, these indentations right here in the front tend to look like eyes. Um, there's even a small indication where the nose might be, and this looks like a mouth, right? It almost looks like a prehistoric smiling face. And that seems to be what's important about this artifact. Now, what's interesting is, is that this could not be used as a tool for, like, say, hunting or for war. It doesn't have that ability. It's not that useful. It seems to be only important because of what it looks like. So the question is, why? Why is this pebble so important? Or in other words, why would the being that carried this, and they may have carried this for hundreds of miles, I'm not sure what's going on right now, but they have carried it and put care into it. Why would they do so? Why would they waste energy? and even hinder themselves in order to carry this object. So before we even go further, take a moment, maybe pause this video, and consider what is the Makapan's got pebble? In other words, what was its significance? Why would someone waste time carrying this, okay? So this could give us a window into what makes humans human. Because oftentimes when I lead a discussion in my face-to-face -face sessions, uh, and I have this pebble up on the, on the projector, um, I get all kinds of really interesting answers that range from all kinds of things like familial bonds to entertainment purposes to perhaps spiritual or religious purposes, right? So there's all these things that this pebble could suffice to serve. Now, here's the interesting thing. The being that carried this pebble was Australopithecus africanus. Now, remember, I'm using that archaeological perspective. So maybe that's not comfortable for you. So you might just say this is a really old fossilized remnant of a species. Doesn't matter to me in that sense. All you have to know is that this is a really old object that predates people. Okay, so Australopithecus africanus. Um, the interesting thing about this object, this person or this, this entity is that we don't typically classify it as a human being. It may be a relative of a human being, it may be a cousin or some kind of other thing, but we don't usually classify it as a human being. However, the Makapan's got pebble carried by this being seems to challenge that notion. Because here's our problem. We don't think that artifacts or art can be attributed to things that aren't human beings. We have a kind of a specific rule here that in archaeology and in history and historical historical perspectives, um, art is created by people, it's created by humans. So what that does is it means that like a bird who makes a bird nest isn't making an artifact, or a chimpanzee that strips a piece of, of, of uh, a twig in order to fish out ants from a log is using a tool, but we don't call that an artifact. Or when magpies collect shiny objects, or when dolphins collect sponges, right? They're doing these things, but we don't call those artifacts. We also don't call, um, artwork made by like chimpanzees or made by elephants, art, right? It needs the idea of a human behind it. But the problem is this pebble seems to challenge that notion because although it was carried by something that we don't necessarily categorize as human, it seems to have a lot of humanness in it. The other interesting thing about it is, is that it was not created. It was a found object. We did some CAT scans of the object itself. We were able to tell that these things, these eye holes and this mouth hole was not created by um, fractures or by pressure. 
it was created by erosion. So this is a naturally created object so that this Australopithecus looked down in the river and saw this object and said to herself, this kind of looks like a face. At least that's what we think. But the problem is we don't know because this is prehistory. We've never talked to these people and we don't have any written record of them. Comparing Australopithecus to us, Homo sapiens, us modern humans or anatomically modern humans, we send, we send to see that there's a lot of differences between the two, right? Even just looking at the two different skulls, you can see there's great differences in the way the brain case works, the skull case, um, the size of the eyes, the way the jaws hinge. So there's big differences between the two different species. And if you look at the recreations of those species, right? So this is Lucy, uh, an Australopithecus africanus specimen, and she looks much more ape-like than she does human. We would not categorize her as human typically. Whereas this is actually a recreation of a very ancient uh, person found in Great Britain, and he looks just like us. This is a very modernized human. There's great differences between these two species. But one has to question, does the pebble maybe change the definition of who Australopithecus is, or does Australopithecus change the definition of the pebble? So these are some great questions to ask when you're reflecting in your journal. So what you could do is you'd be comparing and contrasting the skulls of the two different species and then using the Pebble as a third artifact to help connect or tell a story between these three. Now the Pebble is significant because it's the oldest object that we know of that has any symbolic meaning to it um, and that is likely linked to us as human beings in some way, either because we do similar things later in our biological and history, or um, in the sense that maybe Australopithecus isn't as ape-like as we tend to portray it. Okay, so this would be a great journal. Uh, what you would do is you would go through, analyze what you know about Australopithecus, analyze what you know about Homo sapiens, and then also take a look at this Makapanska pebble and put that in this context of these two other objects. That's one way to tackle journal one. If you'd rather not tackle journal one using that artifact, I have another one. So we're gonna take a look at two different artifacts about body image. So this would be a different theme, a different way to an analyze, a different way to look at things. The first of these objects is the woman of Willendorf, sometimes known as the Venus of Willendorf, and Mattel's Barbie. And what they overlap in is this notion of what body image means for our culture. Now, one of the things I like to really talk about in this course is that even though we might be separated from our ancestors by thousands upon thousands of years, the decisions those ancestors made still impact us every single day. And we aren't really that different from those people. Yes, we've got different technologies, and we've got different laws and rule systems, but at the end of the day, biologically, socially, psychologically, we are still very similar, if not the exact same people as our ancient ancestors. All right, so to do this, what we would do is we would look at these two different objects, one from prehistoric times, one from the modern day, and we would be looking at the similarities and the differences. If you look at the Venus of Willendorf, um, this is a handheld object. Um, it is, there are, there are actually many different versions of it. This is just one version and it's very old. It's 35,000 years old, um, give or take. And it obviously represents part of the body in different ways, okay? So if we look uh, specifically, um, it has, the, the sculpture shows enlarged breasts, an enlarged belly, wider hips, wider thighs, but it has very undersized arms. You can see these here, they're barely noticeable. Very undersized feet. Um, and then the face is almost completely absent and instead is replaced by this pattern, um, kind of either hat or braided hair. We don't actually know what this is. There's a couple of guesses, but because these are prehistoric peoples, we don't know for a fact um, what that might represent because there's no writing to, co to corroborate. Okay, so the question becomes, why would the artist spend so much time focusing on reproductive organs 
Um, you can see here that the genitalia is carved in great detail. The breasts are carved in de great detail. Even the belly button is carved. Yet there's no eyes, right? Or there's no nose. So the artist had the ability to create an eye or a nose, but chose not to. So we, we then try to understand what could that symbolize, right? And so although we don't have a for sure answer to this, based on our observations, we're able to deduce we believe that these objects that look like the woman of Ovo um, are based in fertility, right? And that fertility would have been an incredibly important thing uh, for our ancient ancestors. Um, the mortality rate for birth would have been incredibly high. Um, and we, we believe that there's some kind of worship or some kind of sacredness to fertility. And that the female form is being celebrated for her ability to produce and nurture young. Okay, so these are some ideas that we make about this ancient artifact just by our observations. And then we make some inferences and interpretations about it. Now we can make some deeper interpretations if we compare this object to Barbie. And the reason that becomes important is because Barbie tells a story about us, but we know Barbie's story. Right? We have written record of it. It's within modern history, right? Like there are people who were born before 1952 who are still alive today and can tell us the history of Barbie. We can read the records from Mattel and, and these kinds of things. So we know the information about Barbie. And what Barbie can tell us is that the things about her could be similar, if not the same, as our ancient ancestors. Okay, so what do we know about Barbie? Um, if we look at Barbie, she is representational of what we consider an idyllic or an idyllic form, meaning it's the perfect idolized form of the human body, right? So she is thin, she's fit, she's got an hourglass figure, um, and so she's a symbol of beauty. Okay, uh, she has um, detailed face, facial expressions with makeup, um, she's got long straight blonde hair, um, she also has an enlarged bosom, she has enlarged hips, long legs. So these are the things that we would say in Western culture are attractive. Now, we have to be careful here. Um, beauty images have changed for all throughout history, right? So this is just one version of the idolized form, uh, but there are definitely certainly changes throughout our history, right? If you even go back in a few hundred years, um, you'll see that, you know, larger women were more attractive than thinner women, Skin colors were different, uh, there are different levels of attraction. Um, even within modern times, right, within the last 50 years or so, we've seen the hourglass figure be popular. Um, then, you know, even like in the 1970s, you have like the heroin chic look. Um, in the 1980s, you've got the physical fitness look. In the 1990s, you start seeing the um, more fuller figure women becoming more popular, right? So we, we know that body image has changed throughout our history. So this is just one version of it. But there is some commentary we can make. And part of that comes from what we know about Ruth Handler, who created Barbie, and we also know about what Mattel's purpose was for Barbie. And that was that Barbie is not just a doll, but she's a successful doll because of her purpose. And what is her purpose? Her purpose is to wear clothes and accessories, right? That's her purpose. She's, she's a fashion doll. So a lot of times people will, will say, well, Aaron, you know, you're cr critical of Barbie's image, but you know she's an astronaut, she's a lawyer, she's a brain surgeon, right? And all the while she does it in pink high heels, driving a pink Corvette to her perfect dream house. Um, and, and she's she's a full package, right? The problem I have with that is, is that if that's not actually the story of her. She dresses up like an astronaut, she dresses up like a lawyer, but she doesn't really take on those roles. In fact, if you watch Barbie movies or read Barbie coloring books and books, you'll find that that isn't her job at all. What her job is, is to attract a mate, right? That's what she is. She's intended to be the perfect, beautiful form to attract Ken. And Barbie and Ken get married throughout history, right? And they do it several times. And this is an important piece of the puzzle. But there's also a commentary here on American culture, because although Barbie is this perfect form, um, what is she saying? What is the communication happening here? What is perfect? What do we say is perfect in American culture? And furthermore, 
um, you know, not to be crude, but if, if you, if you declothe her or disrobe her, you find that she is not like the Venus of Ullendorf. Her, her an anatomy is not represented. And in fact, she lacks the anatomy. The interesting thing here is, is that Barbie is a sex object, a sex idol, right? But she isn't supposed to have sex, right? Like she doesn't have a baby, right? There was a couple of failed attempts to give Barbie a baby, but at the end of the day, um, she's meant to be youthful and she's meant to uh, not really reproduce, right? She can have a sister, she can have friends, but they aren't her children. She's meant to be kind of frozen in a perpetual state of youthful beauty. All right, so I bring this up because if the Venus of Ullendorf is about sex and Barbie could also be uh, a sexualized object, there's a lot of comparison here. And one commentary you might make is that we have been looking at the female form in a physical way for thousands and thousands of years and we have not changed. One commentary here is, is that neither object represents personhood, represents emotions or identity, or represents brain power or you know, the mind. We're literally only talking about the physical form. And there seems to be a commentary here that even in our ancient past, the female form was linked to its purpose, which was procreation. And in our society, the female form is linked to um, you know, sex being a advertising or a marketing tool, right? Like, so there's certainly some overlap here between the two. Um, this is also an interesting kind of side note is that Barbie's purpose then is to teach young girls how to be the perfect woman, right? Um, and we see all these kinds of really dramatic and, and, and pervasive issues with body image of the culture today. And it comes from images that look like Barbie. A side note would be to apply this same kind of thing to other idolized versions of females um, in our modern history. And there's probably no better place to look than the Disney princesses, right? So take a moment as you're thinking about this and look at the Disney princesses and see how they, what purpose they serve. Um, each one of them, each one of them, um, is less about the princess's identity and more about her being the damsel in distress, or in other words, to get the mate, right? Just like Barbie's sole purpose is to get Ken, the princess's sole purpose is to get their prince. And that message is clear all throughout. If you look at Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, um, Ariel, Belle, uh, even Mulan and Pocahontas, right? All of these princesses. It's about body and not about mind, right? You know, to be critical of it, right? To think of, say, Belle in, in Beauty and the Beast. She's perhaps the most um, intellectual of the princesses, right? Like she's a book, she likes books. And she's, you know, she likes the library. But at the end of the day, um, you know, that's not her story. Her story isn't about her intellect. Her story is about, you know, being a prisoner and perhaps suffering from something like Stockholm Syndrome where, and then falls in love with her captor. And forgives her captor for all of his transgressions in order to have the happy ending of the of the mating. Right. Um, the same is true for like Ariel, the little the little mermaid. Right. I mean, here, here she falls in love with a prince without knowing anything about him. Um, changes her species, uh, becomes mute, and is to woo the prince. And there's a commentary there, right? Like I mean, she's not to speak. Even even the character Ursula says that. The men are not interested in what a woman has to say. They're interested in her body language, right? So this commentary about uh, body and sexualization, um, especially when it comes to children and it comes to women, um, this is an important topic to discuss. And you can certainly see uh, this is not a new phenomenon. This is as old as it is to be human. 